really speaking, when a bhikkhu is ordained, he is given the practice by his upachaya, who is the man who ordains him, the, the preceptor. And the meditation he's given is Kesa Loma Naka Danta Tacho. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin. Like that. That's the meditation practice. And this is technically the pariyati, which is the theoretical learning that we have to do. The rest is practice. In other words, the the teaching amounts to perhaps one or two percent. The rest is doing it. And just correcting problems when they come up. That's really what it comes to. The practice of Dhamma involves not only the meditation but also one's behavior in ordinary life. That's very important as well. The way one behaves, the one's manners, one's uh, interests, the thoughts that go on in one's mind, all these things are important. <coughs> because everything uh, has its effect on us. It's, it's one of the things that's misunderstood actually in in, uh, in uh, the Elizabeth sphere the television and things like that there's a sort of vague idea people have that there are two types of program one is entertainment and the other is educational and what's not really really realized properly is that in fact they're all education everyone because whatever goes in through the senses person learns from and uh, everything we, goes in through our eyes, ears nose, tongue, body, everything we learn from it all the time and one has to see uh, what the nature is of those things that we do learn from and a lot of it's not very good in the world and we also need to learn to protect ourselves from it as well to know what, what is good for us and what's not because until one has very strong mindfulness one can't protect oneself except by avoidance uh, I mean things like television uh, video cinema newspapers, magazines these things w one has to know what is good and what isn't good and how to avoid what's bad for one's own purposes for one's own sake the trouble is that most of the bad stuff is very rousing rouses up one up because it catches onto those things in oneself which are very sensitive um, greeds, hates uh, other sort of things which we're interested in and hang on to and when we see something about these or some, some see something on the television or we read about it or hear about it then we become interested and people learn about things which are not good ten times easier than they learn about something that's good every time it's interesting how in the schools the children generally learn more from each other than they do from the teachers and what they learn from each other is are the bad things mostly well, from the teachers they learn they learn what is right I, I, I don't know what really can be done about that I think probably the people who should be doing most about it are the parents mm -hmm. but they don't know as much but we should watch out and realize that whatever goes in through the senses that has an effect it may be small or it may be large and also the younger a person is the more effective it is because there's less background to put it into order so to speak when something goes in at a very early age in a person it has a big effect because it sticks there and it's relatively much more important than if it goes in later on 
when a person's many years, when they're old, they're old or they're getting older like that, then their background automatically puts a lot of this stuff into proportion. Now we see, see the importance of it and we, we can quite easily deal with it and there's no problem there. But the child can't do that. Hasn't got the background. So what goes in goes in very deep. Now Chan gave a talk a long time ago now. I was listening to it the other night. He said some very interesting things on that. He said that the the world which means samsara and the, the world of people and the world, the usual world this has its path the way that it goes along it has its rules it has its modes of conduct and all these stem from the kilesas the defilements within them uh, this has been sort of worked out in a trial and error basis because people want to avoid uh, suffering and they try to find some sort of path which produces the minimum of suffering in the world and because of that there is a path in the world and the kilesas, the defilements are so arranged that anybody who tries to get out of that path finds difficulty the kilesas tend to pull them back into it again they're pulled back into I mean we can say that the path is in in one instance anyway what we call society and anyone who tries to sort of go against that they're pulled back into it there's a, always something which comes along things come along to try and pull them back in mainly they're from themselves and the way of Dhamma is, is a quite different way because, because the way of the world is one way you can never get free from the suffering one's bound in it it's as though one's in jail and one's not free uh, one may have some pleasant experiences there or not but one's never free and one knows that sooner or later one's going to just one's going to come to a great deal more suffering one way or another because if one doesn't in this life in next life we don't know where we'll be born and then the one after that may be sooner or later we're going to be in a pretty bad, bad and rough situation if we don't do something about it the way of the world is the way of maintaining the present situation and the suffering here whereas the way of Dhamma is the way of getting free from this the way of freedom because it's the way of freedom though and it's going, going rather against the way of the world difficulties come up and the Kilesas object to it they don't like it they find all sorts of excuses to avoid going in that direction and in this we have to realize the rightness of the direction and fight against the Kilesas yeah. and the more one does that the more one gains the freedom too and the freedom comes I don't know how general it is but I would say at first it comes as a as a pervading sense of happiness uh, contentment you, one doesn't know quite why it's there but it's there and this is this is an indication of, the, of more freedom and less being bound down by the ways of samsara <coughs> the freedom in Dhamma this is a little bit technical, I don't know whether you understand it, I hope so. <laughs> uh, in Dhamma there's really uh, two directions. One direction is the wrong direction. The way to way is towards bad things, evil things. The other is the right direction. Now, if one looks at the way of going towards evil things, when one does bad things, the results come back on them and they come back uh, in a way which corresponds to the action that's been done in other words if you, if you do something physically harm a person it tends to come back as physical harm to oneself it's almost as though it's a, it's a reflex coming straight back on them when one goes in the direction of what is good 
it becomes far less definite like that. We get the results back in the same way, but they don't always come back exactly as they were done. They come back in rather, rather more diffuse, diffuse ways. And this is the way it should be, because the more one's going towards freedom, the more the boundaries are breaking down. They must, because freedom means no boundaries, no bounds, no limits. Uh, when one's breaking down the limits, the bounds, which, which sort of bind us in, we're, we're getting more freedom all the time. But at the same time, results that come back from our actions also become much less limited. And there's far more freedom there. And the more we go on, the more diffuse and uncertain do things become. The hard categories, hard and fast categories that we used to have, they start breaking down. Um, the uh, ideas we had where we wanted everything, we wanted to know exactly how things worked and so on, we find you can't do that. There isn't any exactness there. It doesn't work in that way. And this can puzzle people a bit. But at the same time, there is a growing sense of happiness and of lightness and freedom. And the, the, the way of Dhamma, in other words, is a way of getting more and more towards freedom. And freedom means the breaking of boundaries, the, the, the breaking of all limits, like that. Until the, the final state, the ultimate state, is where there are no boundaries, no limits, no conditions. We can't even imagine it, but that's, that, that's what it's what, that's what it says in the books there. I mean, it's asankata, which means unconditioned, the unconditioned state. So one can see that the, the way must, one must go is towards the state where one can no longer define things very easily. But at the same time, we, can, we have to, at the moment, as we are in this world, get some clear understanding of what we're about, what we're doing, what we should do, and the directions we should go. And if we do that, the rest will tend to take care of itself anyway. As one goes on in Dhamma, also one gets a growing certainty of the rightness of the path one is on. And one views other paths and one sees, one checks, and one, one looks to see whether these other paths could possibly be wrong. One gives one's doubts full, full reign if one likes. But in the end one comes back and says, well, no, there is only this one way. There isn't any other. All the others are flawed. One find. There are flaws in them. Things that, uh, when you look at them, they also break down. I mean, some of the theories and ideas that people have got in, in various systems, um, when one looks at them, one sees where they come from, and what their origins are. Mostly their ideas are just in, you know, in the minds of the people themselves, which come out. Or they're symbolic or something like that. Sort. Um, there's an article in Time magazine which I was reading. It's a most terrible article. It's all about trying to make out that they can find God by looking at these stars in a telescope. <laughs> the whole thing's really, really crazy. And it showed very much, though, how so many people, how it doesn't matter that they're very intelligent, and they're sort of high up in the universities and so on. They don't know what they're talking about in that sphere. I mean, in their own subject, yes, maybe they do. But their subject itself is, is just uh, a lot of supposition. The whole thing comes from supposition. It's not grounded on, uh, on, on any sort of firm basis at all. I, any questions? Have you any... any anything you want to bring up? I'm just wondering about that <coughs> thing of boundaries, because, I mean, this is, I know, a very basic level, but as, as I've <coughs> gone further in my practice, I've found that there, there is certainly 
a greater sense of freedom and approach to the world. But it, it seems to me on a practical level that maybe because the Calaisis are still very strong but have to be very wise about <laughs> the way you relate to people at work and those sorts of situations. But sometimes um, what for you is the normal and natural thing not for another person? Oh, the thing is this of all when when gets in the direction of breaking the boundaries down the more one does when one realize the situation in the world and other people and the more one makes allowance for it the point is that the more one goes on in that direction the more one will see what's happening one will understand the world mm. one will understand the way of the world and also one understands the problems of the world and by understanding the problems of the world one will also see how most of them are incurable nothing you can do about it or at least the most one can do is just help a little bit here and there wherever one can but the the ways of the world are so macroscopic that, that the individual is not really in a very good position to do much and all, all the, the individual can do is to help where he can or she can as the case may be and that's all nothing much more and to realize also that by helping in that way probably one's helping oneself more than anyone else it's one's own comma it's one's own action in fact if people would only learn to truly do what is good for themselves what is right for themselves they do what is right by the world also but don't worry about uh, the sort of barriers and boundaries you find in the world those you have to just go along with I mean in the world you will find a whole lot of monsters these monsters are the organizations that exist <laughs> Uh, and these monsters uh, they've got no brains but they're very powerful and you have to be careful with monsters you can sort of tweak the tail, their tails quite a bit but you mustn't do it too far otherwise they turn on you and then you're in real trouble so uh, one has to realize these monsters and uh, realize how to how to play with them how to act towards them and the way of Dhamma is not the way of upsetting people either. Mm. Just be careful there, not to. Unless it's necessary as a teaching and one learn has to do it deliberately. <laughs> Otherwise, no. Mm. In the West, people are very... They've got peculiar ideas, really. Everybody feels they must be able to modify the system or the wall to the system everybody wants to have a finger in the pie and of course this is impossible because if they all do their fingers are all pushed in different directions mm. and they make a mess in the end <coughs> there's this feeling of impotence in people though well, they can't do anything and this also is wrong because what they're, they're thinking of is they're thinking of this external phenomena of politics of society of, of the ideas that are there in society and so on and they're wanting to change these or to modify them or to push them in a certain direction and they haven't looked at themselves to see what they are what their ideas are whether they're right all they've done is they've assumed a certain position which is itself an automatic thing you know, just comes up from their past automatically and then they want to adapt things accordingly as they see it being as they see it right but most of these things there isn't any right way there are just various different ways and that's all because of that everybody gets very hot about the ways of society 
about things that, that arise. I mean, the the, um, the amount of talk and the amount of trouble and uh, talk and, and, and sort of uh, emotional outpouring on some of the things that happen in America. I mean, this Mal- Malcolm X thing. Well, I don't quite know how that came about. I don't. I, I didn't. I didn't get into the news about that much. And about the um, question. Hmm? Malcolm X, the Black Panther. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, about the question of abortion and things of that sort. Mm. There's an enormous amount of trouble. And this man who's been uh, killing people who want to be killed in America. I can't remember his name now. Doctor Death. Yeah. This sort of thing. All these are things. I mean, instead of people looking at him and saying he's barmy, <laughs> they all then think that they must get it right here, and they must argue about whether this is whether God wants this or whether uh, it's right in the law or what it is like that. And people will take this up when not even anywhere near connected with the problem. I mean, they take it up just because it's an issue in, in society, and that's all. It's silly, the whole thing. And when people take these problems up, all they do is they get more dukkha, more suffering. And they get themselves all turbulent inside. When they're turbulent like that, they look around for other things to turn this turbulence to. And they find it, of course, don't they? It's a way of society. I mean, one can see it in the world, the obvious thing is if the teaching of Dhamma was there, it would make an enormous difference. But how can you get it there? The trouble is people are not interested. Things people are interested in nowadays are goods, money, position, (coughs) power in the world. And when they're interested in those sort of things, how can they turn to Dhamma? Because they can't see that this is going to help them at all. Another thing that's very important too is the question Tanachan brings up very often, which basically comes down to materialism. Uh, that when a person dies, that's the end, nothing more. There's no life after death, um, there's no results of actions, uh, the, the slate is kind of, sort of wiped clean. This is what people believe, many people now. And it's very prevalent, even in Thailand. Yeah. And people don't understand that, that this is the wrong way of thinking. Because people believe in materialism. I mean, they see the world here, they see this, this, and that. This is real solid. It's, it's, it's something really there. They see other people, they think they're really there. They think of uh, the organizations in this world, and they see them as really important. And they don't realize what sort of world this is. It's a, like a shadow world. Now, even the scientists tell us that this here is. 99.9% space. All this material. You see, the material in the world here is like clouds. You know, that um, um, and then when one looks at the, the way things are in the world, how they've been in the past, one sees how they change and how easily they change. I mean, you get changes and they suddenly happen for reasons one couldn't see before. I mean, who would have expected the communism in Russia just would just go flop like that? It's quite unexpected. Mm. Well, there it is, it happens. And these things just, just change suddenly overnight right. like that almost. And things are like that in the world. They change all the time. People don't expect change because they think that everything's nice and solid there and real and comfortable and they think it's going to go on like that theoretically they know changes take place but they don't feel it because of that they think the world is very real I was saying people look on the world as as real because they look on the world as real they think that when the body dies 
because everything's physical, so the body's gone, so everything's gone. Like that. And they don't look to see what their body is, how they know their body. In fact, the whole of this world is only known through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Nothing else that can tell us about the world. And all these senses are, they're not true really, they don't give us a true picture of the world at all. Take the sense of sound, sound's easy to see. Out in the world there is just vibration, there's no sound. It turns into sound when it gets into us. Sound is our interpretation of that vibration. But the vibration doesn't even get into the nervous system. It, it just, just gets to the cold chill and it just irritates the nerve endings. What goes in isn't sound, isn't vibration at all. It turns into sound then. Out there there isn't any sound. And yet people automatically think that there is. <laughs> it was hard to believe last night, something. Yeah, I know, yes, yes. <laughs> right. It certainly sounded like the sound began there and came out of here. Yes. It shows how, how automatic one's ways of thinking are. Also, one, one actually is quite, quite a useful uh, thing that because one can see what happens. Also, when that sound comes, one receives that sound, one also has an idea of location, mm. place where it's located, and that it's a certain distance away, and so on. And one's got the whole picture of the whole environment there, like that, in one's mind. And we place things like that sound. <laughs> what the Dharma Buddhism is about is just accepting whatever comes along as, as what is. For example, last night when the music said, you know, the roosters that are ours and all that. Is that, is that part of... Well, one can see for oneself. If one doesn't accept it, what happens? One gets steamed up inside. Uh, that is just sound inside you. Now I'm getting steamed up about that sound. This isn't doing one any good. So the only thing is to say, okay, if one can use that to try and realize how that sound is really in oneself, and that's one's reaction to that vibration. I'm going to investigate that. Now I might get some value out of it. Also one can get some value out of it by seeing that this sound now is going against what I want to do. Uh, because of the frustration there, there's dukkha, suffering, discontent. And this discontent can then make one angry. We can see what it, what happens inside oneself. In fact, there's oculations going on. So, that in, in so far as anything of that sort, the the, the path of Buddhism says one should. Uh, one can't do anything about it. Accept it. If one can, then one has to see whether what one does about it is moral or not. Generally, if one knows the principles of Dhamma, one can work out what is the right way of behaviour in his It's not very difficult. And the thing is to, to try and keep up the development of calm. Mm. Um, try and keep it up in your lay life if you can. Mm-hmm. The thing to notice is this, when I was doing the practice, then you find something happens in the day, and then it sticks. What in what we technically call a Ramana, or a Ram in Thai. Um, it becomes an emotional hang-up in one way or another. 
And this thing, as soon as I start to practice, this thing just sort of comes up so easily all the time. And it distracts our attention, time after time. The best thing to do when it's like that is just turn off and have a look at the problem and see what's happening. Not so much the, 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 the uh, pros and cons of the problem itself, but the way that this is coming up all the time in oneself and see how, it, how, to, how it's operating. And these aramana, they're very important. These, we're full of all sorts of things like that, with pet grouses and uh, things that we don't like and things that we want and things that we do like and endless other things. And these are the things which come up and stir one up all the time. And one starts thinking on those things. And those things grab the chitta. And if one has enough mindfulness, one can realize what's happening. One can stop it. If one watches very carefully, one will see that a large amount of this is just words going on in the mind. Now, one thing you can try and do is stop those words. And to stop those words, you want to watch them. And you find that it's almost like bubbles coming up from inside until they turn to actual sounds in the mind. And if you can watch them until sort of follow them down, you find inside what happens is an idea arises. Now this idea is much more like a feeling or a, or a pattern. It's all there in one moment, the whole thing. And then one has to this, this comes out and then one has the job of putting this into a logical form all the way through which can take a long long time explaining it to oneself but really speaking one knows the whole thing at that moment then. it's all there right at the beginning right at the seed of it and if one can realize that and say oh I know what that is no need to deal with it I know it <laughs> and cut it off but these, these things, they come up just as little things, just a seed like that. You know, the first thing to realize is that when one becomes more mindful, when one becomes calm, and when one becomes more mindful, one starts seeing these things which are really going on all the time anyway. Mm -hmm. Mostly when one doesn't notice them. Mm -hmm. And when it comes up like this, it becomes obvious what's happening. And one can see something of the, the bad nature of it, how it's always just there. And it's, it's, it's a lot of rubbish sort of going on and on and on in one's mind. Oh, we can't shock. stop it. Even though it's anything for us, it's shocked at all. But at the same time, one can then see where the problem is. Mm. When one knows where the problem is, you know where the enemy is. Uh, and you, you know where the work is. Mm. It has to work there. Uh. As to getting this block coming up, yes. This is a normal thing. Uh, quite a lot of people do a particular practice like Anathana, and then they come up to this point where it, they get trouble, where it's difficult, they can't get through that point. So they think, oh, I'll try Buddha. So they do that one and it comes up to exactly the same point. Mm -hmm. up, up, yeah. Whatever practice they do, it comes up to that point. Mm -hmm. In other words, what it really means is that Sometimes they've got to make up their minds, persist and go through that. Mm. See, mm. regardless. Mm. Mm. Take a deep breath and go through. Mm. Oh mm. <laughs> That's really what it comes mm. to. It's, um, it's quite a hang up there. If one can get through that, really get through it properly, it'll make amazing changes. But it's not easy. Generally speaking, it requires quite a long period of doing practice. Uh, best when one has got nothing else to do. By a long period, I mean anything up to six months or more. To gradually get more and more into the calm and let the lay life just drop away gradually, gradually. Yeah. Okay. That's really what's needed. But not many people get the chance of it. Mm. <laughs> mm. It is 
A great help if you were a good teacher, like someone like Tara Chandra. Very valuable one. Right? Mm. Um, because he can help. Mm. He can help quite a lot. No doubt about it. More one can develop of sadha, faith, faith in the teaching, mm. the easier does it become. Um, because then when the, when the teachers can point the way, the resistance is cut down straight away. And it takes everything in much more easily. And uh, one has confidence in as well. The, the behavior that I was seeing in the local bots and with the local people in monks were nothing yes. like here. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a meditation room. Yeah. 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 The goal one really should be going for is always being diverted. Mm. Uh, in fact, this is the kilesis coming up. Mm. Diverting one, then mm. making one forget. Mm. Although you know there's something there, uh, it's a sort of kind of fog and you can't get through it. Mm. And this is typical of the relations. This is the way they work. They they sort of divert. They put bring up so oh you must go and do this just now. You must go and do that just now. Mm. And when I was doing this meditation practice, you must think about this just now. It's very important. Mm. It doesn't at all. And then we think about that, and then you go on. And there's a vague feeling somewhere underneath that you should be doing something else. And about after. 20 minutes one wakes up and says, oh, I should be doing meditation practice. <laughs> How it goes. Tana Chance talked several times that when one's doing the practice, the kilesas keep coming up to get angry with them. Uh, anger is mostly a bad thing. But we must realize that anger itself is merely just a, a function. And if it's turned in the right way, it can be very useful. Because if, if one becomes angry, really angry with them, that gives one energy mm. and the determination. Mm. And you'll find then it's amazing how they drop away. Mm. And that frustration drops away too. Mm. The determination there to like a force going through them. Mm. If one can develop that, it's very good. Mm. Mm. So it would seem that if, if, if you're able to develop that uh, mind, uh, mindfulness or single-mindedness in your, in your actions and meditation, that then you might be able to continue that in the dream state also. Or yes, it's will that. Mm. If you have a will there, uh, you'll break through it. Mm. But you notice that the, the feeling of the frustration is also connected with the heaviness. Mm. So you're pu pulling up a big weight. Mm. And that's also, that's where the effort's required. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and uh, in this, if one can get a bit, a bit angry with the kilesas there, mm. it's very important, very helpful. Mm. But get angry with the kilesis, not outside. <laughs> In other words, if anger comes up, turn it inward here. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. to do. The only one, the only other way is the persistent attack all the time, persisting. Mm -hmm. In one's practice, persisting and you know, bringing a chitta back every time, mm. going on and on, that has its effect, but it, it's hard work and it's slow. Mm. Uh, mm. It, it does work. It, it seems that um, it's such a slippery state in that you can grab it, like you can grab the focus for a little while. And before you know it, slipped away again because of that, all well, the calaisis, all the strong resistance. And it's only in certain conditions that you can just 
mm. pushed through there. It, it actually doesn't seem to be at that point making a lot of effort, but it just it it's just this slipperiness where mm. the where the, where the mind which normally can focus very well or what appears to be able to focus well at this point is is like um, shattered into. Uh, it's yes, not to know. You see, you've got different levels of the chitta. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mind has different levels. And at the ordinary waking level, that's one level, and you're used to that, and you know what that means. Mm-hmm. But you get to these levels which are mm-hmm. probably a bit lower down, or they may be higher up, mm-hmm. and they may be utterly different. Mm-hmm. And what one's got to do is, when one's at that level, work at that level, because it's important. The thing is, this is also very important because this is the sort of thing that comes up in your sl- subliminal states. Uh, and when one's coming towards the time of death, it's important uh, one to be under control if one can. This is where the mindfulness is so important. One can learn to be mindful in all states. They want to be mindful at that time too. Incidentally, it's said that. Uh, to remember one's past lives, one should have been mindful at the time when one died. If one is mindful at that time, they say you can remember past lives. I can't remember mine. <laughs> um, one of the things I experienced last time when I was um, keeping the practice going, and I was getting very, very calm, and I was sort of reading the world differently. Yes. what I had been before. Yeah. And I found that it was a very isolating experience. Um, I seemed to be going against all the time. And um, I just felt very isolated in that um, I suppose the friends involved more in things that say nothing. And, um, mm. In the end, I thought, well, I'm not doing too well with the practice, and I'm not doing too well with life. I'm sort of somewhere in between. Yeah, the thing is, as one goes on with the practice, one gains kind of strength inside. And the more one becomes strong inside, the more one gets a sort of luck chai, the more one feels confident of oneself. When one feel confident for oneself, one doesn't need the support of other people so much, or of the world. And so even if one looks on the world, the world then differently, it doesn't matter. And so if you use wisdom a lot, you can start cutting through and seeing things. And these things can have an effect on one. Uh, I mean, if, if a person was suddenly shown the true nature of things, they'd, they'd probably die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. The time thing is breaking down into the mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That's that's the way of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. But you, if you do that, you must balance it mm-hmm. with a, a calm, a calming practice, mm-hmm. either anapana or metta or something of that sort, mm-hmm. just to cool off. So, yeah. If you can do the develop the calm, this is where the samatha practice is important to the practice for calm. Because if one develops that, then one gets the, the solid basis inside. Then if you use wisdom and see, okay one can take it. No matter. Then one must be very careful about the wisdom side of it going too far without balancing it. And the thing is unless one's got the, the firmness inside it can, can cause a lot of trouble. Mm. A lot of trouble. Mm. One has to be careful of that. Um, it's, it's essential there to develop the samatha because it's the samatha which gives the strength, calm, gives the strength mm. inside. This is which may, what makes the chitta firm. Uh, makes, makes one contented. Mm. That's the necessary thing. This this calm all the time. So we've got to keep it going as well. But uh, as far as the investigation, breaking into, into elements or whatever, 
Uh, don't do that. I would say don't do it unless you have already got a fair basis of calm. Mm. Otherwise, you, you'll get all sorts of emotional hang ups and mm. troubles coming up. Mm. Mm. You won't be able to help it. It's happened. I, I only read. It's kind of happening on its own. I only read about it sort of being a practice after it has yeah. started. Yeah. Yes. The, um, really speaking, the practice of the elements is a method for breaking up the normal view of the world. But people have got a rooted idea of what this world is. And practice of the elements can do that. Another way is in exam- examination of the senses. That can be too. But unless one's got a fairly firm basis inside, it's best to be a little careful on that. Can this be done alone? Yeah, it can be done alone. As long as one can be quite so rigorous in admitting what one's position is. For instance, to know whether one has enough calm and not to let it go ahead into wisdom if if, if one knows perfectly well the calm is not enough. Mm -hmm. This is what's necessary. This is the trouble. How how do you hold hold it? I don't know how to hold back. Uh, Well, usually you have the method of developing the practice on on calm with the parikamma, the Mm -hmm. breathing or the the buddha or whatever it is. And all one does when goes on to that. Because the wisdom requires thinking. Mm. Whereas the samatha practice requires the stopping of thinking. Mm. It's only when great skills are available has have been attained that one can bring the two together. Mm. Then that's very powerful. Mm. <laughs> but, but that's the that's the our challenge. <laughs> The samatha practice, the idea there is you, you mm. cut out the thinking, the sort of restless mm. thinking all the time. Mm. And then the, it's like the mud settling in the pond. Mm. The places settle down, they're calmed down, they're quelled. When they're quelled, then the mind is free. Mm. Anyway, temporarily free from those places. Mm. When it's free from there, it, it gravitates to the heart. And then the, the 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 mind becomes more and more an entity in itself. The body drops away, and there's there's knowing. What finally left with nothing but knowing, and just knows. There's a knowing there, without any specific object of knowing at all. But there's knowing, uh, and that is a state of extremely great happiness more than the person has probably ever experienced before. Sapana uh, Samadhi. Coming out of that state then they want to do it again and usually they can't. <laughs> <laughs> Frustration. <laughs> they can't because when they try to get back to that state they're always thinking of that state and they're thinking of the method of getting back there. <laughs> That's why. Mm. But that state is the, if one can get to that state regularly, that's the state to get to. Mm. Because then you can drop down to that calm state any time. Mm. When one can do that, that's ideal for developing wisdom. Mm. One can then develop mm. wisdom. Mm. Because the, the chitta is very firm inside and it's strong. Mm. And the distraction has all been allayed, or easy, is easily allayed anyway. Mm. But that state of samadhi isn't the end result. The kilesas are all there still. Mm. If one lets go of it, they come up. Mm. It's like a mud in the bottom of the pool, it's settled. You just stir the pool and up it comes again. Mm. The, the, to get rid of the mud, one's got to mm. use wisdom. The trouble is with the world is really our sensation. The world is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. That's it. They can't find any other world. 
And the world also implies this body. We don't know this body except from the senses, except for those senses. So the whole lot there is, is really inside ourselves. But we like to believe that there's something outside ourselves which we can contact. Because if we don't have that outside ourselves that we can contact, what does that make of me? Uh, to prove that I am, I have to have something that's out there. Faith is neutral. It's a bad factor unless there's some wisdom there. It's a bad thing. Because a person who's got to a blind faith can turn that faith to anything. It can be to uh, uh, Buddhism or Christianity or Communism or Black Magic or anything. They just, they just jump and it, it can jump and take faith in this and grab hold of it and they won't let go. Because of that it's, it's a factor that's it's quite powerful but it's, it's bad unless there is some wisdom there to direct it.